Welcome to our Bible class lesson on this afternoon. We're grateful again that you have tuned in with us. I think we have a very exciting lesson that we're going to get into tonight, and it's our prayer and desire that it will certainly be a blessing to each of us. Today's topic that we'll be dealing with is entitled The Challenges of Today's Church. The Challenges of Today's Church. From its infancy to this present day, the church has been in a predicament where it's always being fought, being challenged from without and from within. So this lesson has been designed <clears throat> that we'll basically look at five principles that will give us a better insight of what the church is actually facing today. Uh, these five identities, of course, are not conclusive by any manner. And uh, in particular sentence, it may not have any effect at all based on what an individual church is actually going through. But nevertheless, I think we have compiled a list this afternoon that will uh, help us to be able to identify some things that we are at the least to be watchful of and make sure that Satan does not get the advantage of us. The Bible has declared that before the Lord's return, there will be a falling away. We are now living in that time. False teachers are changing the scriptures to fit their ungodly lifestyles. Biblical truths that denounce sinful acts are no longer being taught in many churches. Many leaders have become compromised due to their own sinful practices. The spirit of evangelism and fellowship is being abandoned by many of the saints and leaders as well. No one seems to have time for God anymore. Time clock seems to be the major issue when it comes to worshiping and learning about God. The command of worshiping God in the beauty of holiness is being challenged by new era worship methods that are developed simply from a fleshly nature. Then there is the age old problem of prayer. Many confessing Christians do not understand the importance and necessity of prayer. Therefore, few pray without ceasing, as the scripture has ordered us to do. Again, today we're going to examine five challenges that the church is facing. The first challenge is a theological sound doctrine. The second challenge we'll look at is the challenge of compromised standards. The third challenge is the challenge of evangelism. The fourth challenge is the challenge of constant prayer. And the fifth challenge is the challenge of proper worship. Let's take a look at the challenge of theolo theological sound doctrine. And I wanted to start uh, with this particular uh, challenge that we'll look at when theological sound doctrine because if we fail to get the doctrine correct, then everything else we do uh, is going to turn out to be null and void. The Bible talks about a form of God, but denying the power thereof. It is the scriptures and the correct understanding and application of the scriptures that help us as Christians to receive the benefits of God's spoken word. If we fail to line up with the word of God, then we are not going to benefit from the purpose of the scriptures as God had left them on record for us. The church has always faced issues of false doctrine. You go back to this infinite state uh, in the New Testament church, even during the era of the law, uh, many of them that professed to, fo to the fallen of the law did not understand the intent and the meaning of the law. So of course, when the New Testament church came in and transforming uh, themselves from under the principles of the law, until what the word of God was telling them, the New Testament church, many of them uh, got a lot of things wrong because they never had an understanding of the purpose and intent of God's word. So the church has always faced issues of false doctrine. Many have abandoned the truth of God's word and have come up with a doctrine that fits their ungodly lifestyles and their denominational teachings. That's what's happening in the church world today. Those that used to hold fast to the principles of God's word are now letting go of those principles and those practices of the past that the word of God outlined, falling in line with denominational settings that they have set for themselves. And let me just say this on the offset. I'm not uh, one that really have any care for or against uh, any type of denominational setting, uh, what we may call ourselves. But what my main concern is under that title, are we mindful in obeying the word of God that has been left on record to us? So so we have no room to, uh, I guess, uh, separate ourselves to an entity. And under that entity, we create our own uh, denominational teachings. 
uh, that, that's going where error is going to come in. And that's where the disapproval of God is going to be upon that group of people that would do so. So we see that they are doing that because of their ungodly lifestyles. They make uh, a change to the word of God to fit their status versus where our lives are to measure up to the standards of God's holy word. The Apostle Paul expressed in Ephesians that there is one Lord, one faith and one baptism. So any doctrine and the teachings that we will use must fall upon that standard of oneness. So where do we get all these multiple choices when it comes to the word of God? Biblical doctrines have been exchanged for the doctrines of men. Biblical doctrines have literally been exchanged for the doctrines of men. The scriptures have commanded the body of Christ to speak the same thing and fall under the same judgment according to the scriptures. Now, what that means is that no matter what part of the world you go to, uh, anybody that's up on the salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, and no matter what language they speak, uh, you should hear them speaking the same thing. Ephesians 4 and 5 says, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So nobody gets the leisure or the self-pleasure of creating their own doctrine, of creating their own standards. Uh, uh, the word of God is our standard barrier. You don't have to create what the standards would be. The word of God already creates that. What we have to do is learn those standards and those principles that God has outlined in his word that we can fulfill the purpose of God's word that he left on record for us. First Corinthians chapter one and verse number 10 reads, now I beseech you brethren by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen to this, that you all speak the same thing. It's always been the intent, amen, of God through his word, that his people that name the name of Jesus Christ will speak the same thing, listen, and that there be no divisions among you. Uh, listen, that, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So do we see here there's a challenge for theological sound doctrine. And this is where, this is where local churches in particular, uh, a group of believers may get themselves in trouble when they start formulating their own beliefs. It does not matter what language the belief is in, as long as it's the word of God. We do not get that, that uh, leverage or that privilege, or uh, even that opportunity given us of God that we can create our own doctrinal beliefs. Amen. He tells us in the word of God here uh, in 1 Corinthians again, 1 and 10, that we are to speak the same things. Amen. When it comes to the word of God, the next challenge that we'll look at and this lesson is the challenge of compromised standards. Amen. When you fail to speak the truth of God's word, then you are in a state of compromising. So now the thing that governs you, the standards, uh, the measuring stick, which is the word of God that you utilize uh, to guide you, it becomes compromised because I cannot have active use of the word of God in my life for the purpose and intent of that word and, and, and just choose that I'm not going to obey this or just completely cut this part of the Bible out. Uh, we don't teach on that. Uh, you can't teach, you know, a, a certain principle that's outlined in the word of God. And I say that to say this, um, the word of God is given to us as a reference, is given to us as a guide, as a help, uh, that we may be able to effectively uh, live the, out the life God has given us here upon the face of the earth. And that in that living, amen, that we will literally be prepared when the Lord comes back to rapture his church. So the challenge of compromised standards. Uh, nobody wants to meet up to the standards of God's word. Uh, nobody wants to feel like that there's a certain qualification. And here's what the Bible says. He said, many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. God does not choose everybody. And he does not choose anybody by preference of your geographical location or what background you came from. God chooses us according to the standards of his word. We're living in an age where the modern American church seems to have been influenced by society rather than society being affected by the godly standards of the church. Now, that, that, that is critical that the church is moved away from actually having a positive effect on the society 
versus now society is having a negative impact on the church. And that's backwards. That's not how God designed for it to be. The church is being influenced by a spirit that calls that, that a spirit rather that caters to the needs and desires of the flesh. The church is being influenced by that spirit that caters to the needs and the desires of the flesh. Each man has become his own judge and has refused to be judged by the standards of God's holy word. Amen. Man has come to a place that he feel like in particular that he does not have to line up a man with the standards of God's word. Recent statistics show that the more dysfunctions among profession Christians closely align with the dysfunctions of secular society. In other words, uh, recent studies tell us that when it comes to the ill practices of saved and unsaved, uh, in many cases, uh, if you're not careful, you will not find a difference. Amen. And that's why the Bible, amen, enlightens the Christian that you're the light of the world, city that's set on a hill that cannot be hid. And it's important that the activities and the practices of a saved individual be completely and recognizably different from the practice of those that are unsaved. Our present church generation is participating in domestic violence, drug abuse, alcoholism, sexual immorality, and disobedience to civil authority. These are things that you are finding happening in the church world. Amen. It's happening among, amen, baptized believers. And, and we have to understand, amen, the Bible tells us that the law is for the lawless. Amen. The lawless is those that have not made themselves, of course, subject to the word of God. But the problem that we're having now is that those that have been born, amen, of the spirit, born of the word of God, are now starting, amen, to be affected, amen, by the same ill uh, malfunctions and practices that you see happening in the earth realm. The church is encouraged to embrace the advice of, of Apostle Paul given to the Corinthian church. And, and that was to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. Amen. Paul encouraged us to cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of the flesh. In other words, those things that the flesh desire, those things that the flesh have a passion after that does not uh, uh, line up with the will and the word of God. He said we ought to cleanse ourselves. And what we ought to do is practice perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 1. And he states here in the word of God, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, Paul was not talking to uh, unregenerated, those that were not saved. Amen. He was talking to the, the believers at Corinth. Amen. And you might find that it's a, it's a strange subject matter that Paul would have to speak of this sort to individuals that profess salvation. Uh, but but if, you, if you're not walking with God, if you're not walking with God, then you're drifting away from God. Now, I'm talking about somebody saved. If you're not actually walking with God, you'll find yourself drifting away from God. Amen. So here now, Paul brings them amen, back to a place that it had become a time now to cleanse. And I believe that's where the church world is, is today, is that the church world has to be cleansed. Amen. From all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Amen. Those things that. Amen. We find pleasure in that God does not approve of are now being accepted in the church world. Now, when I say church world, I'm talking about a group of people that come together and profess. Amen. Godliness. God himself would never accept those things. And this is why and you hear me say this so many times. This is why many are going to stand before God in the last day and declare, not lie, declare the great works that they have done. And God is going to look at them and say, depart from it. Your work was of iniquity. In other words, what you did was intertwined with sin and you cannot ever take that which is right and that which is good and mix it with sin, mix it with wrong and offer it to God. And that's what the world is doing now. The world is mixing sin with some good, some righteousness. And then they, they shove it over to God and say, accept this. And God will not accept anything that has sin in it. And this is why he has left us here in the earth realm for the time that he's given us that we may get the practices and the desires and the acts of sin out of our life. Listen, if you will. And the next one we're going to look at is the challenge of evangelism. Amen. Evangelism has more so reference to reaching the lost. The modern church world has become mostly occupied with what God can do for them rather than remembering their mission to reach the lost for Christ. Uh, people are losing that identity and that purpose. 
of being able to realize that God saved you. Amen. That now you may become his witness, that you may reach. Amen. The lost that's in the world. The gospel of prosperity has taken precedence over the importance of souls being saved. Everybody just want to get rich. Everybody just want uh, uh, a prophecy over their life about getting the job, about getting their own business. Amen. Nobody is concerned uh, more so with the saving of souls. And here's what the Lord said. And, and, and let me just say this on the offset before I say that. God is not against a child of God being prosperous in life in the job market. But God has an order for everything. His order tells us that we are to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and to seek that first. Then when we seek his kingdom, his righteousness, he tells us all these other things, those things you so desire. Amen. He said those things will be added unto you. But we live in that world today, amen, where prosperity gospel, amen, is overtaking the church. And uh, it's almost like if you don't preach prosperity uh, gospel, people don't want to come and hear what you got to say concerning the word of God. They come looking for something tangible and that, that can become a problem in church. Uh, we don't come to church to look for tangible things. We're coming to the house of God because we have a spiritual need. Amen. Even though we got to uh, supply the needs uh, of being a human housing, you know, clothing and things of that nature. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. But we don't come to the house of God to seek uh, materialistic things. We come here that our soul might be fed, our souls might be healed and our souls might be prepared for the second coming of Christ. The duty of being a part of helping an individual come to Christ is considered a burden to some. Some people don't want to be bothered with individuals in their infinite stage. They're babes in Christ. Amen. And they need someone just to walk with them. So people look at that as being a burden. Uh, in other words, you get it like I got it. God expects all believers to participate in evangelism. Evangelism includes encouraging a new convert in areas where they may be coming up short. Uh, when we first get saved, uh, there are going to be uh, times when the new convert, the babe in Christ, is going to stumble. And, and because they are not accustomed to uh, dealing with uh, failure on the side of trying to attain a man, a godly life, some of them tend to give up very quickly. But this is where the mature baptized believer steps in and, and, and take them by the hand and not just tell them, not just tell them, but demonstrate to them by example that this is the way that God wants you to be able to proceed based on what you're dealing with. Each situation will be unique, but our job is to keep them before the one that is able to deliver them in every area of their lives, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has ordained us to be witnesses, amen, for his church. In Isaiah, he declared that he chose us and that we are to be his voice to the lost. God chose us, amen, to be his voice to the lost. Listen to Isaiah 43 and 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So Isaiah lays it out very clearly that we have a, a, a responsibility of being a witness for the Lord, not just also a witness, but also a servant. Amen. Ready, ready and willing to serve the Lord. Now, so when you talk about being a servant, you're talking about time involved. You're talking about commitment. Amen. So I want you to see here. Amen. Uh, this challenge that the church is facing on evangelism, uh, uh, if you're not careful, you'll be headed in the wrong direction and will not be, be performing the work of evangelism, helping people be saved as God intended for us to do. The next challenge that the church faced today is the challenge of constant prayer, the challenge of constant prayer. And one of the I think the most damaging things about prayer is not understanding what prayer is about. Prayer is not a gimme, gimme, need, need session. Uh, when you go to God in prayer, first of all, you should go to him and knowledge him as God. Uh, there should be some thanks that's given towards him based on not just alone what he has done, but based on who he is. And God, God does not have anything against us laying out our requests for him. But prayer should not just be practiced whenever we find ourselves in a state of need. The Bible tells us men ought to always pray and faint not. Amen. Pray about everything because Satan operates in a spirit of deception. Satan looks for an opportunity where he can slip in any door that we left open, any opportunity that we lay bare. Amen. He can walk in and try to deceive us in practice of a coming part 
uh, some type of sin that would damn our souls to hell. So prayer is one of the most powerful tools given to the church. Amen. If you want to arm yourself with, with some tools that will help you to be prepared to make it through this Christian journey, this Christian walk, then prayer is one of those most powerful tools. Just imagine having someone you can go to about any problem, issue or situation that you may be facing and yet get results. Sometimes you go to people and you go to different uh, uh, help organizations and they'll look at your situation and it may be what they do. But based on where you are, they say, I'm sorry, we can't help you. God would never tell you that he can't help you. This is why when, when, when he initiated the call through salvation, he told us to come as we are. Amen. No matter where you are, nothing that we deal with is too hard for God. We're not so deeply entwined in something that God can't snatch us out of it. Amen. And when I say snatch us out, God can literally deliver us. The Bible said whom the son set free is free indeed. Amen. No withdrawals. <laughs> Amen. Nothing that has power to pull you back when you want to go forward. Amen. When God sets you free, amen, he literally does that. But you, you got to indulge in prayer. You got to talk with God. Now, prayer also means that the one that is praying understands that they have a relationship with God. Amen. A relationship is not based on uh, us coming together when just I need something. Amen. A relationship means that there's a cohesive bond that's there. And I'm not just coming because my cup is empty. I'm coming for fellowship. Amen. I'm coming to give honor. I'm coming to give praise. So now that when it comes time to make requests, uh, you don't have to go through the mold of, of feeling guilty about not praying and now trying to convince God to do something for you. God has set up a place where the Christian can get such results. Again, that place is the church. Prayer affords us an opportunity to approach God, not just with our problems, but we're also granted the opportunity to go to him on behalf of others. Amen. That's wonderful because sometimes people be so weak and people be so out of touch with God and people that be so burdened that uh, they lose their direction and being able to approach God. So God also give us that, that, that opportunity, that privilege to go and come to him on behalf of other individuals. That's called intercessory prayer. You're interceding on the behalf of someone else. If we're going to survive the attacks of Satan, we must have an effective prayer life. If you're going to make it, if you're going to be in a position that the devil don't turn you back, you must have an effective prayer life. An effective prayer life entails understanding, and utilizing prayer. Prayer must become a part of the believer's nature. Amen. I'm not just praying out of command. Now, I come to a place now that prayer is a part of my nature. If I don't pray, if I don't talk to God, if I don't commune with God, then I feel like my day is not complete. And we should pray. We should pray be, literally before we start our day. Amen. At the least, these are, are at the least. Before you start your day, don't, don't, don't dive into life and the issues of a new day without, amen, uh, bathing yourself in prayer that God may lead you and guide you and get you through that day. And once the closing of that day come, once you come to that time of retiring for the afternoon, we ought to be in a habit, amen, that we close that day as we take our rest uh, for the night with some sort of prayer before God. Let's look at Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 and verse number 15. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Verse 15. Now mine eyes shall be opened and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. He was talking about the house of God. Amen. So God gave us a remedy and God gave us a platform. God gave us amen, steps that we can take amen, through the method of prayer amen, that God will receive our prayer. And, and, he, and he says something here that I, that I love. Amen. Uh, you don't have to be right to pray. <laughs> Amen. You could be wrong, but you have to come to God to get right. Amen. And, and, and this is where he said, if my people will pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Amen. So, so you seek his face, you pray, but there has to be a change to take place in your life. You cannot practice the sin habits of the flesh and, and still think that prayer is going to be effective in your life. Now you may sin, you may fall, but utilize prayer to attack that fall, to attack that sin by coming to God and asking God to give you the strength 
to overcome those things that are affecting you. The final, final challenge that we're looking at in this lesson is the challenge to proper worship. The challenge to proper worship. Uh, people don't understand that when it comes to worship, amen, again, God does not accept any and everything that we offer. Amen. Uh, uh, God tells us about decency and order. Let all things be done decently and in order. All things, everything we do. Amen. And you ought to want anything that you're participating in that's attached to God to be at its very best. Uh, uh, you don't offer God the same things that you offer to the world. You don't offer the same things to God how you offer other things to the world. So there's a challenge to proper worship. Let's look, if you will, the word of God illustrate that he is a God of order. When you follow God through the Bible, amen, he's a God of order. He's not a God of chaos, amen. He lays a plain path. When the priests were to go in and offer the sacrifices, amen, God gave the order even down to where everything was to be in that temple, amen, how the animals was to be prepared, what steps, amen, they were to participate in, Amen. In order that they may, amen, offer the sacrifice on behalf of the people. So, so we see here that God is an order, a God of order. You, you know, um, um, some people say praise him like you're out of your mind. No, you, you want to be in your mind when you praise God. Even when the spirit of God comes on a believer, uh, you don't lose your common sense. Uh, the Bible said the spirit is subject to the believer. It's subject to you. Amen. So, so in other words, the spirit of God does not overcome you that you cannot control yourself. And I say that to say this about proper worship. Sometimes we can have a, a, a learn, a, a practice of worship. And there's nothing wrong with that in its proper place. But I call that learned behavior. We behave this way because my brothers and my sisters that I see uh, behave this way. When you look at the worship styles, and every church has a different worship style, nothing wrong with it. But when you look at the worship style of a local group of people, basically everybody in there worship the same way. And, and that's learned behavior and nothing wrong with that. They're worshiping God. So so if it's learned behavior, then we have to learn proper behavior. Amen. Uh, uh, you know, the old saying, I used to dance in the world, but now I'm dancing for Christ. So the dance has changed uh, uh, because the partners have changed. You change from from the world to God. And this is why when we talk about proper worship. Uh, we can't worship God like we dealt with things in the world. It must be a difference and it must be noticeably different. Uh, God, he expects that we are to be in order and know how to behave ourselves in the house of the Lord. Amen. The house of the Lord is different than any other place you go to. Amen. Uh, um, uh, I remember um, having a visitor one time and he came in with his, I think it was a Mountain Dew soda. And he wanted to sit up in church doing service and drink out of his, out of his Mountain Dew bottle. And I told him, you can't do that in here. I've had brothers to come in with their hats on and want to sit in service with their hats on. And I tell them, remove their hats because the house of the Lord is different from any other place. And, and, and you should reverence and have a respect. This is where the spirit of God, amen, meets with mankind like no other place that you ever meet God. And this is why, amen, you got to know how to properly worship God. Church is not the place to seek personal attention or demonstrate an exalted attitude. We don't come to church to make one feel better than the other. Uh, in some cases, you'll recognize if you're not careful, you'll recognize a dignitary or a politician uh, uh, that comes to pay you a visit, not for worship because they want something from you, your vote. And then the saints of God that's there all the time won't, won't recognize uh, them in any state. That's wrong. When a politician comes to the house of God, he ought to come to the house of God for the word of God. Amen. Uh, uh, we, we, we are not to be indulgent and making one greater than the other. You know, I'll recognize this one, but I won't, I won't recognize this person. So let's see if you will, as we go, any form of worship should be to the glory of God and should never be competitive with another saint. Amen. Make sure you're not worshiping uh, one person rejoicing and I can rejoice better than that. So they just finished rejoicing and now I'm going to show you how to really rejoice. No, you don't want to become competitive. Uh, uh, when you talk about worship, it should be a response to God. Amen. I'm responding to God based on uh, what he has done for me, based on who he is. Amen. Based on what he means to me in my life. Uh, we, we are challenged to know what is decent and in order. We're challenged as believers to actually know what's decent and what's in order. Everything is not decent. 
Everything is not in order. And that's why, amen, the leaders, the pastors has to be watchful over the congregation and make sure that the congregation don't drift off into some form of worship. Amen. That's originated out of self. When I say originated out of self, amen, there's a fleshly guidance that uh, uh, produced that type of worship. The church should never become a fashion show or a church uh, 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 that's having a dance contest, per se, who can worship God the best. Uh, uh, you, when you're having a, a dance off in church, uh, the, the people that's dancing off who can praise God the best, as we may say, uh, uh, those individuals are going to wind up with the glory. Amen. God wants us to worship him in the beauty of holiness. Amen. God don't want it to become competitive and people worship differently. Uh, based on their character, uh, based on what they've been through in life, uh, they respond differently. And, and God can give us all these and allow us to have all these different sorts of response as long as they're decent and in order. If your worship takes the attention away from God, then the probability is you're not worshiping God. Let me say that again. If your worship takes the attention off of God, the probability is that you're not worshiping God. And when you worship God, you want people to be able to see God in that process as you may worship. Uh, let's come to a conclusion. Every Christian is challenged to overcome the hindrances that block the unsaved from desiring to become a part of the church of Jesus Christ. If we're doing something that the unsaved can legitimately say they don't want, be, don't want to be a part of the church because of that. Amen. We ought to work to make sure those things are removed. What we do, what we say and how we act can have a profound effect on the life of the unsaved. You remember, uh, they don't have the knowledge that the saved person may have. They don't have the strength, amen. They don't have the patience. <laughs> they don't have the spirit to help them uh, like a person that's saved. So we gotta be very careful about the things we say, the things we do and how we act. Let us become motivated to be a better Christian than what we were literally just on yesterday. Amen, so I thank God for you today, I pray Amen. That this lesson is proven to be a blessing to your heart, that you will accept these challenges on a personal note. Amen. And as you look at these uh, different identities, amen, that we examine ourselves. Amen. Where are we in God when it comes to these challenges? Amen. It does not mean that a person may have just an ill spirit, but the Bible tells us, my people, amen, if you're not careful, amen, you can let it be lost for a lack of knowledge. Amen. You don't know what the word of God says about. Amen. The subject matter, what you're participating in. And this is why Bible study, amen, is important. Amen. This is why, amen, you should indulge in the word of God. The Bible says there's a way that seems right. Amen. When you analyze it, you come up with a sense of it's right. But the Bible tells us if it's not lined up with the word of God, the ways there are the ways of death. Amen. It'll cause your soul to wind up being lost in the end. So again, we thank God for you. You continue to be safe. You continue to pray. Amen. That God bring us on the eve, the closing of this pandemic, that we can get back to some sort of normality in a better sense before this virus came upon us in our houses of prayer. Amen. Undertake all of our services and all of our practices that we used to partake of before uh, this virus came upon us. So in Jesus name, we pray for your safety. We pray for your help and we pray that God will keep you till we meet again.